Hi, I'm Phil Craig. And I'm Andrew Loney. And together we aim to bring you the most scandalous stories and some of the most scandalous people in history. So thanks for joining us here on the Scandal Mongers podcast. Hey, Andrew. Hi. And we have another great, very successful author from the States today, which I'm looking forward to. Yeah, we're continuing our theme of talking to all the very best American writers. Um, last week, Randy Tabarelli was maybe the most successful biographer in the world. And now um, Gerald Posner is joining us today, who is one of the finest investigative writers I think I've ever read. Um, yes, I agree. I'm really looking forward to it. I have a great deal of respect for him. Uh, and such an extraordinary range of subjects, you know, really big subjects, which you would think he just needs to do one of these books. But he's he's done Kennedy, he's done the Vatican, uh, you name it. Yeah, well, I really want to talk to him about the Vatican. It's a story I know a little bit about. Um, and it's dark and mysterious and very, very scandalous. So that'll be fun. Um, so it's a sort of end of term feeling because we're going to have a little break. Yes, I think it's probably quite good that we pause and perhaps get a bit more feedback. Uh, we've both got books to write uh, and then return for a new term. Yes, new I mean, term. it's almost, in effect, an academic year we've done. We have done nearly an academic year. Uh, we started in November. We're going to have a little um, three or four weeks off, and then we come back rejuvenated and inspired in uh, in September. Uh, but I should thank people. I love to do all the feedback. We've had loads of emails, actually, in the last week with really good ideas. Um, for stories, which we're definitely going to do. So thank you for everybody who gets in touch. So Jesse Attack wrote to us um, with a really cool idea um, about management consultancy, amongst other things. We've got a really nice email from... Um, let me find all these emails. All our viewers' uh, listeners are tremendous, but this man is literally tremendous. In fact, he's Bill Tremendous. <laughs> That's his name. Uh, I don't know where he's from. If you're listening, Bill, thanks for being in touch. He wants to do something on... Um, um, Princess Margaret and oh, that's uh, good one. marriage to Lord Snowden, which I think is really interesting. Um, and finally, finally, on my desktop, which is a bit messy, um, one of our Canadian listeners, uh, Donna Marie Pye, um, wrote to us an, another royal idea, actually, um, that we, which inspired us to think about doing something in the next run about. Um, that sort of curious four-way relationship in the 1920s and 30s and 40s between um, Wallace and Edward, which you know a lot about, Andrew, and, and of course, George and uh, Queen Elizabeth, the Queen Mother. And that would be really cool. So it seems royal subjects people seem very keen on, on um, um, hearing us on. I mean, it's interesting looking at, at the stats for, for all the things we've done. I mean, the most successful clearly have been Valentine Lowe talking about Kate and, and – uh, sorry, um, Kate and Meghan uh, and Meghan and Harry. And then after that, I'm seeing the Mountbatten seem to be popular. Then we get to Prince Andrew and Ferguson. Then we get to the Australian scandal, which was sort of another royal story. Then we get to the Diana Wars. So it's that's our sort of top 10. Seems to be all royal stories. Yeah, you are right about that. What's that famous quote? A, a, a brilliant edition of an ordinary life. Um, is it Bagshot said that back in the 19th century that, that we look to the royal family as as a kind of um, exemplar, both of our um, happinesses in our lives, but also tragedies and divorces and arguments and everything's on a much bigger scale um, with an awful lot of glamour and, and kind of fairy dust sprinkled on. Um, and I don't know. I mean, what's your theory about people's obsession with the royals? You've written enough books. Well, about I think it is, it is, it is, you know, it's it's an insight. I mean, it is, it is a psychodrama in many respects. I mean, it's more extreme often the case of what goes on in one's own family. You know, there are clearly a lot of interesting things going on at the moment. We've got a new new reign, uh, so there's an opportunity, and we've got clearly two black sheep, Harry and Andrew. So it's 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 a rich story, but it's interesting people want to go back in time. But, you know, today in uh, the mail, they're serializing another book on Andrew and Charles. Uh, I, I had someone this week who's uh, a lawyer who has been investigating uh, a case to do with Princess Margaret, actually. So there's still stories coming up about the, the royals. And there's a very interesting book I've been reading by someone called Ed Owens, which is looking, he's an academic, but it's looking at the new reign uh, and arguing that there needs to be some reform if it's to, 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 to continue into the uh, and to flourish. So I suppose it's a big issue, uh, and clearly our readers like hearing about it. And we, we're fortunate, I suppose, we have the contacts to get some really good people, 
you know, we've got Andrew Morton coming to talk uh, in the new season. Yes, that's we're really talking. exciting. I'm, I'm, I'm well done to get Andrew. He's perhaps the most successful royal writer of all of them. Yeah, well, I mean, his Diana book is amazing. I'd like to talk to him about Diana's death. I know you, you know, there's a lot of debate about that. Again, a book I've been reading uh, prevent, presents some very compelling uh, information about something that went wrong in terms of investigation. Um, and I think that probably may interest people. Um, so there's lots of yeah, lots of rich material, but we're always keen to hear what people want to to listen to and and, and the sort of guests they want to have. I mean, I'm very keen to get Georgina or Georgie Campbell on, who has a big following and has very good contacts in the royal family, who's written about, for example, the marriage of, of the Queen and Prince Philip. Well, maybe we should do a whole programme on the death of Diana, because I, I was very influenced when I did my Diana work, which is 20 years ago now by the uh, the investigative journalist Martin Gregory, who's an old friend of mine. Um, and he kind of was very dismissive of any suggestion that there was a surveillance of her or there was any kind of a plot to, to, to that, that may have led you know, accidentally or on purpose to her death. But, you know, it's an interesting thing to discuss. And if there's new evidence, we should talk about it. Yeah, well, I'll send you this book. I mean, okay. you know, it does sound pretty incredible, but th- there is a lot of material there, which is you know, questionable. Uh, we talked at one point of having, looking at the death of, of David Kelly. Several books have been written about that. that. Yeah, this let's is, look uh, at that. That'll be good. You know, uh, a very good investigative journalist, Miles Goslett, looked at that. Um, and that's to do with, I suppose, the the uh, war in Iraq, the, well, the, 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 whether there were me- weapons of mass destruction. He was involved in that. So, uh, you know, it's difficult for us to believe that there are these cons- high-level conspiracies, but it's it's worth looking at them to see if there's any any iota well, of truth. You know, we the other area that we've, I think, made some really interesting programs on in this first year, that's nearly over, um, are the miscarriage of justice. You know, that post yeah. office scandal that was an amazing program. Um, and, and uh, you know, I've, I've got somebody I'm talking to who's an expert on the Hillsborough, scandal yeah uh, which is yeah. something i'd really like to talk about because i actually was there i was one of the i wasn't there for the actual um the the, the crush when people died but i was one of the very first journalists um i was, wasn't a sports journalist to turn up so i worked for granada television in liverpool where of course all the fans were from and i happened to be nearby seeing my mum um yes knowing that would be good I, I like these stories where where there's a personal involvement i think it adds something Absolutely no. I think it's it, it's a shame that those miscarriages of justice programs don't get more traction because, as I say, as, as you say, I think you know we can be proud of what we've we've highlighted there. All right. Well, before we go to Gerald, I think I should give you an update on the charts. You know, I stare yes. at these things every day. Um, I, I got very excited that we were uh, big in Belgium and we appeared in the Greek charts, <laughs> Argentina, and the most unlikely one of all. I mean, this I, I assume this is the the latest program with Randy. Tara Borelli, talking about Jackie Kennedy, but we've appeared in the charts in guess where, India. Gosh, just this week. Gosh, which is a pretty, kind of amazing, really. Um, I, I, I had a little look. Pretty much all of the top podcasts in India seem to be in English. So there's obviously an awful lot of English speakers live in India. Um, but we'd love to know if if you're from India and you're listening. If you're marvelling in Mumbai, if you're all ears in Agra, or if you're just confused in Calcutta. Sorry, couldn't resist that. Get in touch. Let us know why you're listening, where you're listening, and what you think. Yes, indeed. Get in touch wherever you are. We love to hear from you. We certainly do. Radio. Well, um, let's go and talk to Gerald. Should we do that? Yes, excellent. Let's do that, Gerald Posner. Here we come. Well, we're delighted to have Gerald Posner on with us um, this week. Uh, Gerald is a writer I greatly admire for his investigative books, a uh, range of books he writes about. Uh, and his very even-handed approach to things. So he's a perfect guest for us. Uh, and what we thought we'd do, Gerald, is talk a little bit about God's Banker, but perhaps just as an introduction, perhaps you could just tell us a little bit about how you got into writing books uh, and some of the books that you've written about. You know, uh, Andrew, I actually uh, got into uh, writing by uh, being a, a lawyer in the uh, the U.S. and representing a group of twins who had been experimented on at Auschwitz, the death camp, uh, by Joseph Mengele, the angel of death. They uh, wanted to uh, collect some money to pay for the medical costs that they had as a result of the experiments he had done to them decades earlier. And so in the early 80s, I took that on as a pro bono, as a charitable um, case. We got thrown out of federal court, but I spent a few years gathering thousands of pages of information. And then I made the great mistake in my life of thinking, oh, I have all these documents. 
I can write a book. Um, well, thinking, not such uh, a big mistake. Under- yeah, no, no, I understand that. But now I'm punished for that forever because after 13 books on subjects from Nazi war criminals to the Saudis to 9-11 to political assassinations to finances in the Vatican to a history of the drug industry, I go to some social event, introduce myself, and somebody says, you know, what do you do for a living? And I say, I'm an author. And they say, oh, I have a book I want to write. I just don't have the time to do it. I'm working. Uh, nobody ever said that when I was an attorney. No one ever said, I'm thinking of practicing law. I'm going up before the Supreme Court. I just don't have the time to do it. They, you know, we all write an email or that. So they think the only thing that stops them from doing the books that you do or that I do or the articles that Phil writes or whatever or the, the book he's working on um, is just a matter of not having the time to sit down and do it. So, you know, it's the well, great actually, You know, I was just thinking... I know you and Andrew have a well-developed mutual appreciation society on email, which is reserved on both counts. But I think we may have a friend in common as well. Didn't you work with John Ware on that? Yeah, as a matter of fact, uh, what I left out of that early introduction is that everything that I learned in the early part of how to be a real reporter and writer was a result of having the very good fortune of writing the Mengele book together with John Ware. And when I had a, I found an agent because I had this material and I'd sent a letter in on my own to McGraw Hill, the publisher. It landed on the desk of an assistant editor, which I didn't know at the time meant a 22 year old person who was being paid, you know, $18,000 a year to, to sit there and, and have the title. She passed it on to an editor and they were interested in the book. And we met and they said, but you've never written a book before. So why don't you do it with a co-author? And I said, fine. And I was actually mesmerized by this world in action documentary that Ware had done a couple of years earlier, 1979, on its, you know, typical vintage Ware going off into the field, doing his work on, on, on Nazis. And so I approached him and John was interested. Now, when I went back to Random House, they were very, very impressed with his, you know, resume they didn't realize, they didn't look close enough at the bottom to realize he had never written a book as well. So they had two first-time authors, <laughs> the price of one. But it was a fantastic experience because every time I came back from a trip to South America with some great story that had been told to me by a group of Paraguayans who said, oh, Mengele, yeah, we went bowling with him. We all, our kids went to school with him. He was our dentist. I'd say, John, look what I had. And then he would put it through the real process of journalism. We'd say, how do you know that? Do you have a second source? Did anybody confirm it? You're just being sold a story. And so John Ware was a essentially a master class in journalism that was unexpected. And it was a fantastic start well, to- as one, of his, as one of his researchers on World in Action, in that decade, I can attest to the fact that he was a, he could be a very tough boss, but incredibly rigorous. And oh my God, such a great journalist. Yeah, no, and, and as a matter of fact, in one very quick sidelight, one, one night at John's house in in London, uh, the we had over for drinks an American historian who was then working for the Justice Department and knew the inside of some of the Mengele hunt that we didn't know. So John said, you know what we'll do? We're plying with drinks and eventually we'll get some information. It'll be fantastic. <laughs> so we had him over and we and we were downing the wine and drinking along. And at one point, John fell asleep and I was actually <laughs> the one who had the great legs uh, for this was the <laughs> Justice Department lawyer. He outlasted both of us. We never got a thing from him. <laughs> the, pleasures, the pleasures of investigative reporting. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> Yeah. And do you keep the files going on all these subjects? Because I mean, some of these books go back a, a long time. So you know this, Andrew. I mean, you've re- recently run into all the problems of what good journalists will run into when they kick up dirt on things that, you know, the, the system and the establishment doesn't want you to kick up dirt on, and then they start to fight back against you. But once you've started the process, in essence, what I call the bureaucracy of information, which is the freedom of information request, once those are in the works... Yeah, they fight you for it. They they hold back on them. Some bureaucrat isn't even thinking about the document until you ask for it. And then all of a sudden, they're worried about why you're asking for it and why does that journalist want it. But sometimes things come out years later. So I've been looking into this Swiss financier after the war who may have funded some, some terrorism and that. And I made a request to the CIA two and a half years ago. I'd almost forgotten about it. And then recently received a letter from them that said, by the way, We're not giving you anything. Now I'm appealing that, you know, maybe five or six years. So now I'll get some files of interest. It's the nature. I think I got Mengele files from Freedom Information from the Army 
maybe in 2015. That was the original requests were sent off in 1981. So oh, we should all no. live long enough to get the final releases of documents <laughs> that the bureaucrats send us at some point. But this is where your legal training, I suppose, is so useful that you, you're able to be very forensic, I imagine, in your requests. Yeah, that's true. And one saving grace, and to some extent, I know that you've spent some considerable sums of money on the legal end, you know, in, in getting in, in the documents and fighting for what you've had to fight for so far in the UK over this uh, process with the, the Montbonnet papers. But I don't get a lawyer as a result of that. I sort of do it myself. The problem yeah. is what Phil and you know, Andrew, is time. So we don't have, you know, there's only so much time in the day. I do it together. My my researcher and partner and collaborator is my wife, Tricia. She's also an author. And if we're spending four hours doing, uh, trying to get a document appeal or working on threatening a legal case against the State Department, that's four hours I could be doing in calls uh, to try to get an interview that I need to get. So th there's still a cost to it. I'm just, you know, t too cheap to hire an attorney to do it uh, on a side yeah. matter. Well, the lesson I learned is don't hire an attorney to do it. Probably best on your own. And but I mean, you're talking. I'm talking about the pushback. I mean, you've you've dealt with mafia figures. I mean, every you couldn't think of a worse group of people to be in a sense arrayed against. Have there ever been any problems, or or, or are you quite the, careful about your safety? I mean, you know, I don't think you end up do, doing this work and thinking about. Uh, you know, the, the safety, I think about uh, John Ware, uh, you know, when he used to go uh, cover Northern Ireland, he was covering the troubles for that. Uh, you know, it's not that you aren't concerned. He has he had children and a, and a wife, and obviously you are, but it's not your consideration, it's sort of not in your DNA. And so it's never in my DNA. The worst, the only time I ever had to open up an actual police file, because I was receiving threats that seemed serious, got a box of dead fish, got a rat's tail, was accosted on the street and was, believe it or not, not after a book on the the Chinese triads and the heroin trade, and not after the book on the Saudis, but a book that concluded that Lee Harvey Oswald alone had killed JFK, the, the people who are convinced in their heart and soul that it's a massive government conspiracy and it's been a cover-up for all these decades, couldn't believe that somebody like me came along, wrote a book that said that it was embraced by the mainstream press, like the New York Times was a finalist for the Pulitzer. And they figured that I must be part of that conspiracy. I must be working for the CIA or that. And boy, I'll tell you, it unleashed a torrent of near violence that absolutely startled me at the time. I now understand it, but it's subsided and seems to have uh, been in, in the in Well, the I'd like to say, since you're here, that is one of my all-time favorite books. It is so good, so definitive. It really did change the way the world regard, looked at that much-discussed story. Um, and I'd recommend it to anybody who's interested in, in, well, in journalism, investigative journalism, the Kennedys, that assassination uh, conspiracy theory, which you absolutely put uh, to and bed. Is it perhaps your... Sorry, Andy. I, I lost you there, Andy. Uh, I was going to say, is it is probably your best-known book? And is, it, is yeah. it the one, I mean, is it the book you feel proudest of? No, I mean, it's so, it's so interesting because, you know, this the same with you. If somebody comes to you and talks to you about your best known book, you know, or the book that, that they think of the most often, uh, it might well be case closed. I personally found a book that I did called Killing the Dream about the assassination of Martin Luther King. James Earl Ray, the assassin, that's a much more, believe it or not, uh, difficult to read and 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 hard to understand and a uh, character than Lee Harvey Oswald. Um, and the and the my favorite book often is the one I'm working on because I'm totally immersed in it, right? It's the world. I'm passionate. I'm boring all my friends to tears in talking nothing about that. Uh, and uh, I'm consumed by it. But the works on the, the Vatican in 2015, sort of a financial history of the Vatican, and the last book on uh, the drug industry, those are overarching histories that were, were very, very challenging because of their size and scope. And they're completely different than than Case Closed or the assassination books. But um, I'm incredibly proud of them because they, they're they the types of things that a publisher let me do. And you'll both understand this completely. I'm going to publisher. And I'm saying in the case of Simon & Schuster or before that Random House, before that Simon, the, here's the pharmaceutical industry or here's the Vatican. I'd like to do a book about the history of finances. But they don't know 
what I'm going to conclude because I haven't done my research yet. I need them to commit to the project. Obviously, if I turn in a lousy manuscript, they're going to say it doesn't, it's not satisfactory and not pay me. But I need to know they're there, that I'm getting in advance, I'm able to pay my mortgage and pay my bills. And they have to have the faith that they're putting me on a, a matter that they don't really know where I'm going to come out, but they think they believe I'm going to come back with a good story. And publishers often want you to stay, as you so well know, in the same field. So you've carved out an expertise in assassinations. Well, stay in that, you know, stay in the intelligence realm or keep talking about this. And, you know, I finished something on the Saudis and then I want to go off and talk about the Vatican, which I know nothing about. And, and I'll start from the ground up. And then I want to go off and talk about the pharmaceutical industry, which I know nothing about, essentially. And it's hard to get... Publishers don't like that. They prefer you stay in your the area in, in the lines within the guardrails of what you've built up some expertise on. Yeah, I think that's right. I think it's driven by sales, the salespeople rather than necessarily the editors. But I mean, your track record, I mean, just the sort of, as you say, prizes you've won, your average on, on Amazon is about 4.6, which is incredible. Um, you know, you've shown that you can do it. This is probably a good time to come into God's Banker, which we thought we'd, we'd, we'd sort of concentrate on because it's very relevant to us here the great mystery of roberto calvi's death which you begin the book with uh and the stuff that you found on on the accommodation between the the vatican and the nazis is extraordinary um uh you know the, the, because it's quite a well-known subject covered subject but you seem to i think you said going and looking at files outside the vatican and other countries were able to find all sorts of new things, particularly looking through this prism of the of the financial aspect. Yeah, I, I think that, you know, the challenge always is taking a subject that's well-tread, so a lot of people have written about it, um, and then covering it thoroughly, accurately, but with a little bit of news, finding something in there that's substantive and new, and you don't know what that's going to be. So I thought it was going to be something about Francis or that it would be something new. Um, it turned out to be World War II was the area in which there was breakthrough. And yes, it was this fact that the Vatican Bank, no surprise, I believe, established in the middle of the war, 1942, in order for the Vatican to go black in terms of the British and Americans who had these you know, blacklists that they were looking for to put countries that were dealing with the enemy, with any of the access powers, on the list and then sanction them. So all of the neutral countries in Europe, from Switzerland to San Marino, the little tiny ones, uh, the Liechtenstein, they all were put eventually on the blacklist, except for the Vatican. And one of the reasons they were able to stay off is when they established the Vatican Bank, sort of a mix between the Bank of England and the Federal Reserve and Goldman Sachs, uh, it was doing work that nobody was able to follow. They invested, the Vatican did, both in the Allies. They bought British real estate, some of the best in London. They invested in American stocks. And they also invested in German insurance companies. And remember, at the time, 98% of all of the cardinals were Italian. They had brothers on the other side of the wall from the Vatican in Italy who were generals, who were officials of Italian industry. They were in their hearts and souls sort of pulling for the Italians, they, even though they were technically neutral. So they invested in the Italians as well, including the big insurance companies like Generali. That is where the little what I call news and crime was, because those insurance companies like Generali, which had more private, small insurance policies of Jews than anybody else in Europe. And the big companies like Allianz in Germany, in 43, they start cheating the life insurance policies that they're holding on Jews when those Jews are going to the death camps. They take the cash value of those policies because they know these Jews are never coming back. And they had outsized profits. The Vatican benefited from that. Now, all of that being said, the great news about doing a book on the Vatican is you talked about, you know, in the, in the Mountbatten book, how you've been blocked and how files are destroyed afterwards at the FBI and how the government won't cooperate. I've run into that head wall all the time. But the Vatican is fantastic. There is no freedom of information. <laughs> There's no process. It's up to one person. It's up to the Pope. And if they give you the stiff arm and say, no, we're not cooperating, it's no. There's no appeals process. There's no lawyer in Italy who has the connections who's going to change the mind of the head of the secret archives. And so I was forced to go outside and recreate the history by following the bank transfers back from the insurance companies and finding those files. It was a more arduous and difficult and Byzantine task, but it was possible to do. 
Gosh. And I mean, the Vatican have now opened up some of the files. Have there been any new disclosures as a result of that? No, they've opened up this event. You know, their, their, their PR is better under Francis than it's been in a long time. So, yes, they opened up. The, uh, ah, they opened up the World War II files and the headlines, you know, on the BBC and the Independent and the Telegraph and everywhere will say Vatican files on Pius the second being a 12th being opened. Um, they've allowed a handful of historians in who reportedly, you know, will come out with reports. They haven't opened up all of the Pius the 12th files. And most importantly, they haven't opened up the, the Vatican bank files. And I've continued, I've written op-eds in the Washington Post, the New York Times, and the Los Angeles Times, publicly calling on this reformer Pope, Francis, to open up those World War II Vatican bank files. And the answer that you get is not from Francis, but from one of the, the minion bishops down the, the line, who sends a technicality that says, I'm so sorry, in so many words, I'm paraphrasing, but Vatican bank files do not belong under the secret archives because they aren't the history of the popes. And so therefore they're a separate department and those files are close to everybody, including others inside the Vatican. So the odds of getting real material, what I call the golden treasure of uh, archives, if it exists, I don't think we're gonna see it in our lifetime. So there, so there, 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 the there were famous answer. apologies made after the war, I think in the sixties um, to the Jewish population of Europe and what was left of it from the Catholic Church. Was there ever an accounting of the money that found its way into the Vatican Bank through this rather wicked process you just outlined? And was any, any of it ever returned? No, Phil, you know, it's, it, that's why I think the Vatican is so sensitive about it. And, you know, I'm Catholic, by the way. I was raised Catholic, uh, had sisters of charity in grammar school and Jesuits in high school. I was an altar boy. Um, and so, you know, I, I, my father was Jewish, but I was very much raised a Catholic. And I think that one of the things that surprised me when I did the book is to realize that the Vatican is the only sovereign nation we you know we think about it just as a church we forget that it has this little post-it stamp piece of property also has sovereign status as a result of Mussolini coming to that with a deal in the Lateran Accords in the 20s because he although he didn't like the church he needed the support of the the Catholic Church uh to solidify his hold as a fascist on Italy after they had lost the papal empire it didn't look like they'd have anything and then they got it back that sovereignty allows them to have a flag if they want it. They have observer status at the UN. It gives them the rights uh, uh, to have their own bank. And, and it also gives them the right to sit at a table in the late 90s when the Swiss were finally making amends for the role of the Swiss banks and insurance companies in the Holocaust and making amends by finally coming up with the equivalent of restitution. The only country when Clinton was president of the United States, Bill Clinton, and he had really pushed on this issue, that refused to ever make any financial amends was the Vatican. And they still refuse to this day. And that's because the I provide what I call the smoke in God's bankers, but I can't give you the figures. I can't tell you how much they made. Those figures are locked away inside the Vatican archives. And it, you know, it's one thing to get an apology from the church, but it's another thing to ask for dollars and cents. And I don't think uh, they're very willing to, to talk about dollars and cents. And I mean, you also talked how they destroyed the files every 10 years so that, I mean, it was very much kept within a very tight group of people. So, I mean, do they actually have this material, do you think? I actually, uh, you know, it's, I don't know, but there's a part of me that would be shocked if they had it and then released it. That would almost be a mistake. Um, it's a bit like, you know, we're coming on the 60th anniversary of the Kennedy assassination, and there's still like 4,400 documents that are sealed at the National Archives. So people want the last files released. But I say often to people that even if there was the grand conspiracy that some of them envisioned, the Oliver Stone type conspiracy in which the CIA and the government killed Kennedy, do they really believe that the, these people would have pulled off the perfect crime in 1963 in Dallas. And then somehow, although they've kept it a secret, allowed the document that exposes it all to go over to the National Archives and it's ready just to be disclosed to the public. Nobody's gone in there, broken in, destroyed the document, uh, you know, kept the, the conspiracy. It's going to come out. Even if that document existed, it, it wouldn't exist or we wouldn't see it. And that's probably the case with the key Vatican documents as well. Right. Gosh. And do you think it's getting more difficult to research these books that, you know, with freedom of information, 
things are not recorded. People just want clickbait. They don't prepare to pay for sort of books like this. Ah, uh, you know what? God, my publisher cringes when I turn in an 800 page book. <laughs> they, <laughs> yeah, what are the price of paper? Yeah, they publish. It's just the the price and the, the fact that no one's going to read past, you know, if they if they read the uh, you know a, a paragraph. But the I think it is difficult, but also easier in some ways because we do have from the time of freedom of information and the equivalent of it in the UK, and there are plenty of countries without it, I get that, but it gives us a process with all its shortcomings, with all of the difficulty that the bureaucrats and the governments give us, with the pushback and the punishment like you're getting, uh, with the things where they try to set a lesson to show others not to do it, or they make it so difficult that no one else wants to get there. It's still possible often to get great information. So for instance, in the early eighties, when I applied for freedom of information for Mengele, uh, uh, we got, John Ware and myself, received documents from the U.S. Army that showed that he had been captured twice in the immediate aftermath of the war. No one knew that. It was, you know, just, it was the type of thing that, and then you understand how he was released, and he wasn't on the wanted list at the right time, and the uh, millions of displaced persons. When I arrived in Argentina in November of 1984 for the first time to try to do work on Mengele, we had all heard that Mengele had been in Argentina after the war, but no one knew exactly when or for how long. I went to the Casa Rosada, which is the presidential palace, and applied, as many had before me, to get a chance to see the Mengele file. Now, normally, you'd be laughed away from that. But by luck, I was there when there was a civ first civilian government after the loss of the Falklands War. Uh, the military hunt had been thrown out. Raul Alfonsin was in power. I talked to an advisor to the president, uh, to Alfonsin, and six weeks later, when I was sitting in a small hotel in Buenos Aires, a member, two members of the federal police came up in this, uh, you know, blue falcon, not necessarily a good sign because they used to use those to take away the disappeared, and took me to uh, <laughs> the, to the, the uh, federal police headquarters. I called Tricia, who had left a couple of weeks earlier to return to New York to tell her where I was going in case there was a problem. And there was on a desk, literally a file that was 10 years of Mengele's life. And it was his passport into the country under a false name, uh, his listing and telephone book, the businesses he'd been in, the exit in 59. It was the spasm of democracy, no great brains on my part by applying at that time, but you're just lucky sometimes on research. So when I say we're, we are fortunate, we're working at a time when governments occasionally provide material. There's a legal process for it sometimes. And, you know, then we run into the obstacles you always expect. I, I did a book in 2003 on why America slept, on how the FBI and CIA had made errors leading up to 9-11. The last chapter is based upon two American intelligence sources who described in detail an interrogation of Abu Zubaydah, who's still at Guantanamo, who was captured in 2003, a fake flag operation where Americans pretended he was held by the Saudis, and he gives the names and telephone numbers of some Saudi royal princes and that of Pakistan's Air Force. All four of those people that he names die by accident, by, you know, one's blown up on a plane, things like this, shortly afterwards. The CIA said, that chapter is trash. It's just garbage. Somebody misled Posner. He's bought the hook, line, and sinker, the wrong thing. So I kept saying all the time, and Phil and Andrew, you'll get this completely, there's an absolute proof of whether what I'm told is right or not. It's the interrogation tapes that you have of Zubaida. They caught Zubaida, and from April to December of 2002, the CIA made 90 videotapes of the interrogations they had with him. And guess what? In 2005, the enhanced interrogations, which meant torture, 90 tapes that the CIA had, they destroyed them all. So... Now, there's no way of telling. There's no way of verifying it because the CIA decided we don't want that material public. That's extremely frustrating. But you know what? There was a time 50 years ago we wouldn't have even known they had destroyed it. Now I can rail and rant about the fact that they destroyed that. So I, I see the glass half full sometimes in terms of being able to get information. Can I, can I tell I you about just briefly to the Vatican? Because um, I'm just, I'd love to know, and it's 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 a probably too big a question for a short conversation. But do you see a connection between the Calvi story and what you discovered about the Second World War, or are they just are they two se sort of separate scandals? No. So the great thing is that Calvi is the successor. He's the sequel to World War II in the sense that 
the in World War II, the Vatican had this fellow Nagaro managing it, a lay person who was really clever and smart and savvy at finances. After World War II, the Vatican made the mistake of putting people in charge of the Vatican Bank for loyalty as opposed to their financial knowledge. And the person who took over in the 60s was an American Monsignor, um, uh, the Marchinkus, who said, I read a few books about finances once they picked me to run the Vatican Bank, and I think I know what I'm doing. He didn't know anything more than balancing his checkbook. And what he did, that's when the Italian, what I call the underworld, the mafia decided that they could make friends in the Vatican. They could hide money in there. No Italian tax authority would know about it. And the great bankers of the era, Michela Sandona first, and then Calvi, came out and became partners with the Vatican. There was nothing that was better on your curriculum vitae than being able to say as an Italian banker of a bank, like Calvi was the, the head of Ambrosiano, this Italian regional bank. I also am the banker for the Vatican. That was very impressive to companies you were raising money from and doing deals with. And they would use the bank and Marchinkus to be able to set up offshore accounts in the Bahamas and everywhere else that would transfer money around. And as I say, the Vatican became the largest offshore bank in the heart of a foreign capital, Rome. So the great thing about it was if you were on a street corner with a suitcase with a million dollars in lira um, and you crossed the street into Vatican territory, there's no, as you know, there's no sign, there's no border control or anything else. You're now in the Vatican territory and you gave that suitcase to a priest who had an account at the Vatican bank, it disappeared. It wasn't reported to Italian authorities, what the, you did with it, the interest you earned from it, how it went. So essentially, the Vatican became this black hole for wealthy Italians, for mobsters laundering money, and for bankers who were doing shady deals like um, like Calvi. That was the succession to the, the cleverer work in World War II. Got it. So why did Calvi fall foul if he was working on behalf of these shady characters? Why uh, did he end up hanging for a bridge? Or is that still uh, not really been established? No, you're right. And the and Phil, the great thing is that I do know this without a doubt, although I don't have the final answer as to who killed Calvi. And you know, the last time they tried people, like 20 years ago in Italy, they had a group of, they acquitted all of them. Uh, the in, in great Italian justice style, and I use the word justice in quotes, you, there's nothing worse if you are in league with the underworld and the mafia um, in any country, but in Italy, a longstanding tradition, than to lose money for them. And Calvi had built up this empire that was on paper very, very strong. But when it started to collapse, as these empires are wont to do, when one part of it was pulled out, he was borrowing money from Peter to pay Paul. And he was able to keep it afloat as long as that happened. But he was on the verge of collapse. And there was another problem. He was also under indictment in Italy. So there were two things going on. The empire is collapsing. They're possibly losing money. And now they are worried that Calvi could turn state's evidence right. against them to save his own skin. Boy, all the cards are racked up against him. Gosh. And what's the significance of the way he was killed? Was that as some sort of ritual thing or, or just... No, it's just so fantastic. Imaginative? I wish it was ritual because it would be a better book. The, uh, you know, mm -hmm. people do think, oh, my God. If, if people don't know, different. he was hanging on the Blackfriars Bridge in London. Yeah, that's right. No, no, it's fantastic. So Blackfriars, it's Blackfriars, the Catholic Friars, Church, people and, have always... And, 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 you know, there was a secret group called Propaganda Due that was running in Italy, which had, you know, a ceremony in order to get into. And there's all the material. So it must have been. Yes, it would be fantastic if that was the case. The, you know, at first, as you know, there was a, a, the, the original inquest into the case in London concluded suicide, which is really hard to imagine, considering the machinations that Calvi would have had to do. And he had a bit of vertigo to climb over all this parapet and everything else and put the rocks and stones into 12 pounds inside his pocket, uh, you know, and, and then hang himself at the same time when it eventually came to an open verdict. And then years later, eventually came to murder. But it was clear that you only do a, a murder like that if you want to send a very dramatic signal. The, the people who ended up doing that had a sense of theater, um, a sense of movie making. And I'm not saying they were filmmakers, uh, but they, uh, they clearly were sending a message that uh, was very, very strong that not only can't you get away from us, you can't even get away from us in a foreign capital. And to show you that, instead of just putting a 
22 caliber bullet in the back of your head or holding your head in under a tub of water until you've died, we're going to hang you up under Blackfriars Bridge and let that serve as a warning. Wow. And I mean, you've been doing a lot of long form journalism as well. I mean, you've continued your journalistic career. I mean, do you see that that's a way of dealing with some subjects that clearly don't justify 800 pages? Uh, you know, a lot easier to do. I mean, I don't know if you find this, but I mean, you think, and you, so I have 13 books and people who don't understand the process think, you know, my wife, Trisha has another three books uh, that she's done on her own. So between us, these 16 books, they think you just go to a publisher and say, oh, I want to do a book on the Vatican. And they say, great, where do I send the check? No, it, 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 sometimes they say no. So for instance, I had wanted to do a book on the Kennedy assassination in 1989, Random House had no interest. I ended up doing a book on sons and daughters interviews of Nazi war criminals. Um, the book on the Vatican had been bouncing around since 2006 until I finally found a publisher that was willing to put it on in Simon Schuster in 2015. Sometimes you're just persistent and keep coming back. You refine it a little bit. You send it to a new publisher. Uh, you have a new and fresh idea. The election of Francis was a fantastic thing. You revitalized the church for those types of areas. But there are other things that I propose on books that you know, I'll have a publisher say, we're not interested. That's a better magazine piece. I understand that. And uh, sometimes you try to do it. But long form journalism, it, you know, for a good magazine like the New Yorker, you're running it uh, for the New York Times magazine or that is, and I don't mean this in a, in a bad way. I'm happy to do it. Uh, but it's a lot of work. The It's not as much work as a book, but by the time you're finished with legal review and you're finished with your fact checking of that, and they've cut your 12,000 word piece down to 4,000 words, and you're still arguing to get in that last paragraph. I mean, it's it's a long process uh, to finally get it done. The, the worst thing that happens, of course, from back in the day, I liked when you used to publish in, in a magazine and you didn't really know whether somebody opened up the cover and read your story or not. If they liked it so much that they made a photocopy of it or they cut it out of the magazine or they passed it around to friends. But now magazines know every click you get. They know how far down the article somebody has read. Oh, my God, they're measuring you by these standards that, uh, you know, are, are the modern digital standards of knowing whether, in fact, you've hit a piece that's successful or not. Uh, I just always just like that. The, tr the trick is to have something in the text saying, look at the end. And then you go to the end, and then you get all the pages measured. That's so fantastic! I keep telling the editors that's why I bury the lead, but they don't buy that. They, um... <laughs> so, what do you think you're doing now? Um, what have you? What are the ideas you're considering? Um, I have a few ideas actually. I'm toying with one is a, a possibility uh, they're ever changing. Uh, this is the longest I've ever gone from the end of one book. Vatican, uh, the pharma, the book on the drug industry was published in March of 2020. I had the excellent timing of publishing at the start of the pandemic. Um, uh, two weeks later, bookstores closed across the United States. So I would recommend to aspiring writers, whatever you do, don't publish a book when bookstores close nationwide. It's not a good idea. The uh, But this is the longest I've gone without a book project because I haven't come up with the right one. Um, I've thought of things about Jeffrey Epstein, intelligence connections, and what happened to the money. I thought about things about the gender industry as it's developed, uh, the youth gender industry, um, thought about things to do with the Swiss financier. So I'm up in the air, uh, a, a few balls. Those are great subjects, though. They um, are great subjects. We're, we're pretty much out of time, actually. I'm sorry to interrupt. Um, but I mean, as, a, as, a final, as a final thought, I mean, you, you mentioned that you've worked very hard. There aren't many people publishing long-form journalism and, and long-form essays now, and they don't pay as well as they paid probably 10, maybe even 20 years ago, to people who want to get into the business who are a bit younger than, say, we are. I mean, where do you learn the kind of skills that, you know, some of us might have learned from a John Ware now? Well, I, that I, I, I think that uh, uh, my legal background also helped. I could tell a story for a client in a document and making an appeal. I could make a case. And as a matter of fact, I could make a case on either side of that same issue, which I think is absolutely critical to understand. And this is something, you know, you, I think you recently wrote about this, Phil, the idea that today journalists have trouble sometimes appreciating or understanding or covering their self-censorship because things get into these political ends where issues 
become one political end or the other. And journalists don't want to cover it because they say, if I cover that, I'm helping somebody else. Yeah. Here in the United States, for instance, we have a fentanyl problem with fentanyl coming over the southern border. But there are journalists who won't cover it because they think if they cover the border, that means immigration, that means Trump, that means the wall. So they stay away from the issue completely. And my feeling is my advice to any young journalist is forget about the political camps, forget about the fact whether it's something that's being waived with, you know, at, at the front by Tories or Labour. Look at it as a journalism issue, just the facts. What are the facts behind something? If you can deliver a piece of journalism on a hot cultural topic, a hot button issue, without parroting what the the press, you know, spokespeople want you to say on the extremes, but you come down and make both sides unhappy, you've probably done a good job. Um, I like when I deliver a piece and the people on both extremes who are advocates for it and those who are opponents to it both say, oh, you didn't do it right. You didn't do this and you didn't do that. That's that's good. When I've got everybody hot under the collar, I probably did the right journalism. Well, that's a great, a great end thought. And whatever you do decide for your next project, please come and talk to us about it. I shall yeah. indeed. That was terrific. Thanks was so terrific. much. For Good luck. Ours. And thanks for all the great reads. Yeah, all thank right. you very much. Thank you for listening to the Scandalmongers podcast. This has been a podcast world production. You can get in contact with our show by emailing team at podcastworld.org, placing Scandalmongers in the heading, or via our social media links within the show's bio. 